Hey there, Black Bloods. It's finale night on the Outpost After Show tonight. We had some victories, but also some very, very sad losses. The Battle of the Outpost is here, so don't go anywhere. You're tuned in to After Buzz TV, the ESPN of TV talk. Now, let the buzz begin. Hello, all of you Outpost fans. Thank you so much for tuning in to the biggest night here on the Outpost After Show, which is the finale night. As always, I'm Veronica Valencia, and I'm so happy that you have stuck with me through this entire journey. We made it to the end. Coming up later in the episode, we're going to be talking about this crazy big episode, two-hour season finale, guys. We're going to be talking all about Garrett and his revenge on Sauna, as well as the Kinj. Who exactly are the three? We're also going to be talking about Naya and Janzo. Ew! Like, they really went there. As well as the Battle of the Outpost, Gwyn and her not- brother question mark but her best friend and the setup for a possible season three we also have of course i also have my scene stealer and i'm actually gonna throw in something in there as well and name the the scene of the series and i actually have another special segment for you i have some very very i have a special video with some kind words from some awesome people on the show but before we get into any of that guys crazy crazy big episode like i said two hour season finale like there's so much to unload here i honestly feel like my brain is gonna explode because i had to really just figure out how i was going to break down this episode because there's so much going on honestly i hope i remember everything uh but you know but overall really solid strong season finale the twists were out of nowhere and you know, this show I've come to realize is not a show that uh, shies away from serious storylines. Serious storylines in the sense that they're not afraid to, you know, kill off characters. A lot of the time series are, you know, kind of scared to take risks like that, but this series does that. And so I was very content with a lot of the twists, a lot of the turns. I thought it was a solid episode, guys really really solid and uh, uh, that season finale you know i was rooting for the black blood so i don't know what's going to happen now but you know i really just want to dive into it and i want to start with talon and garrett and sauna because i feel like this was supposed to be garrett's moment you know garrett has had a really rough season you know he started out with a foundation of a warrior he you know his roots were with the outpost he firmly believed and pledged his allegiance to the crown he was a soldier and then of course he gets brainwashed and all of that is thrown out the door he thinks that the person he's loved and trusted his whole life has betrayed him that he's some kind of joke and you know he goes on this entire journey so he's had it really rough this season and i feel like this episode was him to try and regain that piece of him that he felt like he lost you know this entire for the last few episodes he's been wanting wanting revenge and of course talon and maybe even some audience members i know i was i was like dude i don't think that that's gonna help you much like what you did is what you did and sadly it's kind of something that you're going to have to live with it's something that's going to eat you up inside like the fact that he killed his dad i don't know if he will ever be able to get over that but in his mind, he thinks, I need to do this at least now. So, you know, Talon goes with him and they kind of go to infiltrate the uh, camp of the Prime Order army. And so they, they go and they confront him. They were able to swoop in real quickly and they were able to confront the the holy one and his kind which is the pain crusher kind. Uh But before that, actually, Garrett killed the dude, one of the dudes who brainwashed him. So, like... He did complete his mission in the beginning. Um, but yeah, this part, I have to be completely honest, this part I felt slightly underwhelmed because there has been so much hype around the three. They're supposed to be these like fantasy myths of pure power. They all have kinges, so we expect them to be super powerful. You know, they we assume that they're they were the hyped big villain. So I kind of expected more of a battle. I expected kind of more of a showdown. But Talon was able to go right up to the Holy One and stab him. And I was like, there has to be something more to this. You know, all the hype that these guys got. And he's able to go down that easily. 
immediately I was like, there has to, has to be something more to this. And of course there was. And so I kind of liked how, you know, killing the three isn't what was the important part of that storyline. It was, I guess, the Kinge and how Sana plays a part with the Kinge or just the Kinge in general. So guys, I have to ask you. So she kills she kills the three and Sana is able to bring the Holy One back for a split second to transfer. So I have a few theories on this. I'm wondering if the Kinge, the Kinge itself is the Holy One. The Kinge has the power to cause pain and have people die from that pain it's but i'm wondering if the kinj itself is considered the holy one and it just travels around from vessel to vessel because that's what it seems like it seems like the holy one's body wasn't tough the holy one didn't have any skills to protect itself it just kind of relied on the kinj and then when it and then when the vessel's body died it was able to transfer over to sauna and sauna kind of became the holy one for a bit and, you know, she even called herself the Holy One. So I, I'm thinking that maybe the Holy Three are really just the Kinjas themselves. And that's how they live on throughout time because they just move from body to body. They don't have to worry, oh, if I have, if this body dies and I'll just get another one. And maybe that's kind of where Sana's character comes into play because when she was introduced, I was like, Okay, she's inter- She's very interesting. I want to know more about her. And I still wanted to know more about her this episode because she obviously played a much bigger role in this. And I'm wondering if her role wasn't just to kind of be this master medicine potion maker if she was supposed to be like the vessel in training. Because I feel like that's kind of the story. That's how it would happen. So the Holy One would live out their life and confide in someone and train someone to basically be their successor when the vessel's body that they're in uh, passes on and it's time for them to move. So maybe that's what Sana was. And to me, that would make a lot of sense with just how close she was, with how she was able immediately to know I have to revive him in order to transfer the Kinge. And she, she really knew what kind of part she played in that. So yeah, immediately I was like, what's going on? Who is this girl? Like it was, it was crazy guys. I, that was, that was a lot. But yeah, like I said, I I think the fact that that was what it turned into and gave you that idea to think is what made that moment great because the actual battle of three itself wasn't really much of anything. So it was good that they gave you that moment to think of, hmm, maybe it's not the people, maybe it's the magic behind the people. And this is kind of how it goes, or at least that's what I think. But I don't know. Let me know what you think. Uh, As you may know, if you've been following this journey all season long, we have a live chat going right now. I want to give a shout out to Adam Rodriguez and OMG Justin, who you guys join me pretty much every single week. And for that, I say thank you. I truly, truly appreciate it. And tonight we were at a later time because of the two-hour season finale. So thank you so much for sticking with me. Adam says, this season has been amazing with new characters and storylines. And OMG Justin is saying, I really hope we get a season three. All right. Where were we? Oh, yeah. And then, you know, at the, at the very end, you know, Garrett is able to uh, kill Sauna, but he still doesn't feel good about himself. So, yeah, that was kind of what I thought. That was like the first part of the first episode. Uh, now, I kind of want to go into Janzo, Naya, and the Mistress, which, guys, I can't believe they went there with this. It's... It's so, (laughs) I was looking on Twitter and many fans were saying, like, is this Game of Thrones? Like, what is this? Because of the brother-sister relationship, what a reveal. Janzo and Naya are brother and sister. And I have a lot of opinions on that, with first just being like, I can't believe that they went there. A part of me is actually sad that they went there. A part of me is actually very sad that Janzo and Naya can no longer be together romantically because before this reveal, they were a cute couple. Romantically, they were very cute. They understood each other and it allowed Janzo to move on from Talon, which I really appreciated. You know, we all kind of, you know, we all at some point were rooting for Talon to be with Janzo because he was very sweet and they would be a very great, they'd be a cute couple. But 
clearly Talon wasn't interested and we wanted the chance for Janzo to move on, to be happy. And also I felt like we didn't need to linger on that storyline of like, oh, I can't get over Talon. So it was nice to see his growth in character and to be able to actually move on to someone. And so I'm just, I'm sad that that can no longer happen. And it makes me worry that he's going to go right back to loving Talon, which if that happens, okay, but it it just, it was nice to see him move on. And I liked the fact that he moved on. I don't necessarily think we needed, like I said, to linger on that storyline. So, and I feel like this is just going to make him go back to Talon. But the mistress, man, she is comedy in this show. She, you know, this entire season has really taken a dark turn. You know, Gwen struggled a lot with her decisions this season. Garrett, obviously, you know, with being brainwashed. And then, you know, Talon not being able to trust anyone or like what moves she should do and trying to help Gwen with this war. Everyone had a lot to deal with this episode. But no, no, not the mistress. She was always happy. She found herself on top of the world at one point or another. She was raking in all the money, all the drug money, and she was so happy about it. She always brought comedy to this show. And in this moment, too, she was so happy that they were dating. She thought it was comical and it was kind of hard not to laugh along with her because she did make it funny even though at the moment it was so weird and then Naya kind of kept making it weird. She she said the line, I'd much prefer to be your lover. I was like, no girl, no, don't say that. That's weird. Like to some extent, I get that it's probably hard because you've lived your entire life not knowing that your brother or sister was alive and you now come to learn that your brother and your or your sister is now the person you're romantically interested in and i get that it's very hard to basically once you hear that in a like a flick of a switch to just turn off your feelings cuz that's you know that's what has to happen but so i understand that it's hard for her but girl, don't make it awkward with those kind of comments. I was just like, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear it. I don't want it because it was weird. You know, she she made those comments. But at the very least, I really respected how Janzo handled the situation. Of course, at first it was very weird because he was like, oh, I kissed my sister. But then again, I respected how he handled the situation because he was able to say, you know what, I may not be able to have you as a lover, but now I have you as family, like real family too, because the mistress is his family, but as we've learned and as we've discussed in previous after shows, she doesn't treat him like a son. She doesn't have that maternal love for him. She really doesn't care about him. She kind of kept him around for profit. Yet Janzo still has that love for her because that's his mom, that's who raised him his entire life. But now Janzo has the chance to really have a true family member, someone who really does care for him. And even that was kind of sad at the very end where he chose to stay behind to fight the the fight with everyone at the outpost and Naya got evacuated with everybody else. And that kind of that's kind of sad because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I hope they don't get separated again. You know, you don't know where... Naya and as well as everybody else who is in the outpost is going to be once this battle has um, stopped and especially after that cliffhanger like these people could be separated for a very very long time and so poor Janzo you know is like uh, I lost my girlfriend but now I have family but now I might lose her again this he goes through so many ups and downs and it's just can't we just let Janzo be happy guys but I really hope that the story wouldn't keep Naya from Janzo. I would really hope that they can learn to, you know, make up for lost time as brother and sister and really try and gain family because they both lost family. And I, I would really like them to be there for each other and to create that bond. But who knows where it's going to go with that. All right. Next, I want to go into talking about Gwyn, Tobin, and Alton. And so they obviously open up with eating dinner together. And once again, I still fully believe that Gwyn is testing this guy. From the moment that he was introduced, I thought she was testing him nonstop. Obviously with the trivia like, oh, what did we do? 
you know, this holiday and stuff like that. But I, but she even had some very subtle ways of testing. And this was one of the ways I think she was doing it because her and Tobin were playing like, oh, our wine was poisoned. And immediately I was like, she's testing him. Is she testing him in the sense of, you know, he won't react or he's waiting for them to react? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hear me out. So I was thinking that, you know, in Gwen's mind, maybe she's thinking this person who is potentially impersonating her brother wants to cause harm to Gwen and Tobin. So if they brought up the storyline of, oh, the wine was poisoned, they would look out for his reaction, whether his reaction would be to wait for their reaction of, you know, acting like they have been poisoned or his reaction of how exactly he reacted, which was to freak out oh my gosh i've been poisoned i've been drinking all the wine from that cellar so in that sense she could clear the idea of oh he's at least not trying to hurt us but she's clearly still very suspicious of him in fact she is so suspicious of him she brings in her uncle captain calcasar which where has this guy been the entire time i'm actually kind of surprised that he wasn't brought in earlier because he seems like obviously he would be a really good ally and towards the end of this conversation he says he will join Gwyn's fight so if he was if he's willing to join Gwyn's fight and he is a trusted ally I'm actually very surprised that they didn't bring him in earlier unless you know a possible reason could be he was off far doing some kind of business and maybe she couldn't get in touch with him sooner but I feel like the idea wasn't even brought up. The idea of Milas was brought up before bringing in her uncle. And the idea of this, what was his name? Bran, the guy that they wanted to bring in. Um, what's his name? Baron Fenway, I think was the guy, the other Baron. He was brought up to be an ally before Captain Calcazar. So I don't know, guys. Why do you think it took us time to get introduced to this character? Why do you think... He wasn't brought on as an ally much sooner when he seems like a very obvious choice. Either way, she knew she could count on him to set things straight. And he for sure did. You know, he looked right at the guy and was like, I witnessed Alton's death. So Sammy, who it turns out to be, was caught right in the act. And to be perfectly honest, guys, he kind of screwed himself over because at the end of the day, what he was hoping to get out of this was just money. You know, he grew up very poor after, you know, he he lived, I wouldn't say he lived a luxurious life when he was with the royals, but he lived a safe life. You know, he had a roof over his head. He had scheduled meals. He wasn't struggling like maybe some other people were. But once he wasn't with the royals anymore, he did live a uh, strug he did struggle in his life and he didn't have much food he didn't have much money and so what he wanted from this obviously was money he didn't want the crown he didn't want to harm Gwen he just wanted money and Gwen kind of even said it herself it's like well if that's all you wanted why not just come to me rekindle the friendship of old friends and I would gladly give you a place to stay in the outpost. I would gladly feed you. You could live a life of luxury. You can live a life of safety as opposed to the life you've been living. So I kind of, I'm also curious about this. I'm curious on why that didn't occur to him. Because if, if, you know, if they truly were friends and Gwen seems to be in a position where, you know, she would she loves the idea of family possible family coming back into her lives or keeping close friendships he would have been able to just come right in and like she said live fine so i'm very curious why that never uh why that never struck his mind maybe that's just not his style maybe that's just not how he's been living so he didn't think it would work oh here's this guy who's poor begging for money she would never give me money i have a better chance if i'm pretending to be your brother and this was a surprising reveal because last episode I suspected, I said he wasn't the brother, which that was true. I, I got that one right at least. But actually, no, scratch that. My theory was completely wrong, guys. I suspected that he was the brother, but he was uh, the brother and he had 
ill intent. He was wanting to like take the throne and maybe be in alliance with the Prime Order or something. He wanted to Gwyn, he wanted to get Gwyn out of power. That was my theory. So my theory was completely wrong. And it went kind of in a more nicer <laughs> direction with, you know, being able to have this family friend back. And the the thing about this episode is, as I had mentioned earlier, a lot of the characters went through many rough patches this season. And I know for some of you fans felt very divided on Gwyn's storyline because she made a lot of decisions that we, we were probably disappointed in. You know, the fact that she, her sentence with Naya or her sentence with Janzo, you know, how she imprisoned them basically. And... It, this this kind of came to lie in this episode because she realized she was thinking with her head instead of her heart. She was thinking of how a royal is supposed to rule. She was thinking of how maybe her father ruled. She was, you know, she she felt she had to be fair and just, and that is just by the basic concept of how you should be ruling, not how she personally wants to rule. And in this particular situation, it makes sense and i think everybody that she released has done something to show that they deserve to be released or to be pardoned as we were talking about you know naya came back and warned them of the weapon that the prime order had naya didn't have to do that naya knew her fate when she walked right back into the outpost so why would she do that if not to genuinely warn them i think that's a noble enough act to allow Naya to go free. Same thing with Janzo. Yeah, he might have let her go, but he has done so much for her. He has healed people. He has found the curse. He has found the cure for the plaguelings. He, you know, is coming up with strategies for them against the Prime Order. He also has done a lot for her, and I also think that's a good enough reason to not have to be imprisoned. So, you know, finally. Gwen sees all this and she's able to think with her heart and think, you want to know what? I'm my own kind of royal and I'm my own kind of leader and I will make decisions that I think are right and not that I think I need to make because someone is expecting me to make them. And I think that was a really good shift in her character. It was nice to see that because I'm sure, you know, we can all sympathize with that in a sense. You know, there's sometimes this idea of we have to act a certain way because, Someone tells us we have to act that way, even though it's not how we want to act that way. That happens in life. And so I think we really saw that with Gwyn this season. And I liked that we got to see this change in her. And I think we're going to start seeing her come into her own as her own kind of leader. And that's very exciting. And I'm, I'm happy to see her make that journey and make that transformation with Tobin by her side because Garrett gave them her blessing. Okay, guys. Okay, let's talk relationships. Because we actually haven't talked relationships in a while. So I really respected this. I also very much respected this decision from Garrett to kind of let Tobin and Gwyn live their lives together. Because I made this, I made this comment a few episodes ago. I said, even if Garrett does get his revenge, he will never be the same Garrett. He acknowledged that this episode. He knows he's not going to be the same person. And I said, you know, he's going to have so much guilt for all the stuff that he did, how he kidnapped Gwyn, how he didn't believe her, how he killed his dad, how he stabbed Talon, all these things that he did when he was brainwashed. He's going to, it's going to be very hard for him to overcome that. And so I respect the fact that he knows that he has enough awareness, self-awareness to say, I'm not good for you right now. I need to work on myself, essentially. And he's going to allow Tobin and Gwyn to move on because we because we can probably tell that Gwyn is conflicted. She will always love Garrett. She will always have a soft spot for Garrett. And I'm sure every time that Tobin hears, oh, Commander Spears is back at the outpost, I'm sure he gets super insecure and worried because he knows Gwyn will always have a soft spot for Garrett. So I really respect the fact that Garrett said, you know what, Gwyn? We can't be together right now, but you have something strong with Tobin, and I think you should pursue this, essentially is what he's saying. And I really admire that. That was a really good move on his part, and I'm happy that he was enabled, was he was able to acknowledge that about himself, that he is not well currently. He needs to work on himself before he can consider feeling like his old self again, because he did go through a lot of changes. And you know, 
kind of going back to Gwyn saying, you know, she had a lot of ups and downs this season. So did Garrett. And once again, I know the fans were very divided on his storyline this season. And, you know, I understand that, too, because there were certain things that he did that disappointed me. But it's not necessarily his fault because he was brainwashed. And so the fact that he had this moment of self-reflection at the end of the season is what made up for everything, I feel. And the same thing with Gwyn. We might have been divided on the decisions they made and the storylines throughout the season, but the fact that these two characters had very solid moments where they had reflection and they were able to find ways to better themselves is what's going to make their characters go even further. So great job to everyone involved on that. All right, guys. Now is the time for the Battle of the Outpost. But before we talk about the Battle of the Outpost, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much to everyone who's been tuning into the Outpost After Show from season one. If you're new this season, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching us on YouTube as well as iTunes. If you're on YouTube right now, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. That way you'll get notifications about any potential new shows that we do because you know here at After Buzz TV, we do a lot. We have drama, we have dramedies, <laughs> we have dramas, we have comedy, we have fantasy, we have superhero, we have anything you want. And if we don't have it, we'll make it because we know that there's a fan base for that type of content, like ABTV Latino, which we just launched. We knew there were audiences that wanted Spanish television content, and now we have it. So guys, you know, it, we have everything that you could possibly want, so please subscribe, give us a five-star rating on iTunes, because you know one through four don't work, and thank you so much for helping us be the ESPN of TV talk. All right. Let's go into the Battle of the Outpost, because this is where things just get crazy. It's just constant fighting, constant, constant fighting, <laughs> which, you know, shout out to all of the stunt choreography. Looked really insane, like really good. Uh, okay, so I... So Talon is still basically throwing around the idea of summoning a demon army, which I am totally in favor of, just because... I wanted to see her open the portal and have more moments with the Black Bloods. And she did. She summoned the Slayers of Man. She fulfilled the prophecy. So that was really cool because I loved seeing the Lakiri come out and all the Black Bloods. Zed is back, but he might be back with a different motive and he is kind of scary now which is kind of sad, but I'll get into that in a minute. But a lot of stuff happened in the Battle of the Outpost. We see everybody fighting. We even get to see Janzo participate in some combat, which, you know, in the past, Janzo has always been the one to kind of sit out. Uh, t uh, Talon or Garrett or Gwyn would kind of say, stay here, Janzo, stay at the Outpost because he's not good at combat. But we got to see how he benefits to a battle, and that was very fun to see. We also got to see the return of Munt and also... My gosh, we got to see a, a super serious side of Munt, and he just loses it, and rightfully so, because, guys, we lost the mistress this episode. That's, that, <laughs> I was sad by that, because, like, she is the comedy of this show. As I mentioned earlier, the, the show took a darker route and all of the characters had a lot of struggles. But every time we went to a scene of the mistress, she was so happy living it up, kind of giving us as an audience a moment to breathe and being like, hey, we know this is like a, a fantasy with a lot of high stakes, but hey, let's throw in some comedy there with the mistress and Munt. And, you know, it, it, it was even sadder because I think this was the only moment we would have ever seen her showing her feelings toward Janzo. She saw that Janzo was getting ready to be killed and she stepped in and didn't and was trying to protect him. And I know some people could probably think, oh, well, maybe she was stepping in because he's an investment and we know how much she cares about, you know, trying to keep her investments. But guys, I legitimately think that that was a moment of her caring. She saw her son was in trouble. She probably had never really seen that before. And she wanted to protect him. And I think that's what made it even more devastating of losing this character with because it was in that last moment that we saw her being truly, truly genuine 
you know, she plays around a lot with Gianzo's feeling, but feelings. But in that moment, I think she was being truly genuine, and that's what makes it more so devastating that she died. And like I said, this show doesn't shy away from killing main characters. Like sometimes shows will kill off characters, but it will be a minor character that, as an audience, it's like, mm, it's okay. I didn't really care about that character anyway. Or, mm, I won't miss them. But this season, they've killed off the drag man. They've killed off the marshal. And now they killed off the mistress. So the stakes are obviously much higher this season, and they're not afraid to do stuff like that, like most shows. So I really applaud, you know, the writers for taking those kind of risks because it's it's impressive. You know, not many people do that. So the good news is that they won the battle for now, but then they have to go and fight the bigger army. Luckily, Janzo comes up with a great plan, and they're able to succeed in that. And then the very last thing is, you know, Talon summons her army, Garrett detonates the bomb, they're safe for right now, and then the Black Bloods are basically just like, we made the outpost, and now you are our prisoners. And this disappointed me in a good way. It disappointed me in the sense that I didn't want Zed to turn out to be the bad guy. I didn't want the Black Bloods to turn out to be the bad guy. I didn't want them to make them feel like Talon had to choose, because that's what they're saying. You you have to choose. It's either them or us, and it's like, she says, why can't it be both? And Talon should be able to have both because that's how she's lived her life. She's never really lived life with the Black Bloods. She was taken in and loved and cared about by humans, but she knows she feels a comfort with the Black Bloods. She should be able to have a place in both worlds. And it's really sad that they are making her choose. And it leaves curiosity of how is she going to you know, fix this because she is the person in the middle that if you think about it, she is she is not a half blood, she is full black blood, but she is a half blood in the sense that she needs to kind of unify these these two groups of people. And I'm very curious how she's going to do that, but yeah, I did not want the black bloods to end up the army. So, you know, the the season did a good job of wrapping up kind of the main threat, which was the prime order, but now we have the black bloods to worry about. So, there's some room there for season 3, guys. Anyway, yeah, that was a lot. A lot happened these two episodes, and I'm so thankful for everyone who stuck around to, you know, discuss with me. I really appreciate it. Let me know all of your thoughts on this episode. You could leave a comment on YouTube or on iTunes or in the live chat right now if you are there. Adam Rodriguez just did that, saying, Talon told Zed she lost her family, but she found her new family and home at the outpost. It's true, but should he hold that against her? Should he should he feel like, oh, there's no way, you know, you could ever be one of us because you have a family and sympathize with humans? I don't think so. I think everyone should just try and have peace. Just make peace, you know? It's a different time from when they were trapped, but you know, there's got to be conflict in a show, guys. <laughs> but yeah, let me know all of your theories. Let me know what you think would happen if we got a season three, let me know where you think this series is going to go. Let me know about all the twists that happened this season. I'm really curious to know what you guys thought. For right now, though, however, I want to go into our special segment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As always, our special segment is our Steen Stealer segment. And this is our last Steen Stealer for the season. And it definitely goes to the mistress in my book. Don't get me wrong, guys. Every single character had a shining moment in this episode. They really did. But the mistress, I think she just went out with a bang. I really appreciated her last moment of showing genuine affection towards Janzo. And she's been a bright character the past two seasons. She has brought the comedy, as I've mentioned. You know, she's going to be missed. She was a fan favorite for sure. So she was my scene stealer for this season finale. However... I want to expand on this. She was my scene stealer for the finale, but I want to highlight someone, a character, who stole the whole show. And I don't think you guys would disagree with me if I say it's the moment when Munt rode off on a donkey. He stole. This is the scene that stole the whole show all season. It, honestly, like when I think of the outpost season two, this is honestly kind of the thing that comes to mind just because it was it was so random. This 
big guy on a donkey just riding off. It's and people have turned this into a gif on Twitter. It's it's really funny, guys. So, uh, are you with me? Do you also think of this scene when you think of the outpost? What who were your scene stealers? Let me know. And do you have any particular moments that just stole the whole season for you? Let me know those too. I really appreciate it. All right. Now, we also And now we also have another little special segment for you. So as I have mentioned, I am so thankful to all of the fans who join me every single week to watch and engage with me on Twitter to talk about The Outpost. I'm also very, very grateful that the cast also tunes in and they and some of the cast members had some very kind words to say on the season finale. So let's take a look at that. It's not very, oh, it's right behind me. Great. Um, Hi, Veronica and AfterBuzz and everyone. Oh, he's just my little friend over here. And uh, everyone else watching this. Uh, Sorry I can't be there tonight. It was really fun. Just not really in the ideal place to video, really, am I? Um, Sorry I can't be there tonight. It was really fun. Is that what I was saying? Yeah. It was really fun last year uh, doing the show and the finale episode with Jess, but yeah, I'm in Europe right in a minute, so that's that. Uh, big shout out to Afterbuzz and the entire team there for being so consistent and every single week recapping our and recapping our show every single week. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for everyone for watching. And uh, fingers crossed, we will see you guys next year. And if not, this is a really unfortunate ending. Bye. All right, you guys, Uh, that was the season finale of The Outpost. I just wanted to say thank you so much for staying with us the entire season. I know that Garrett especially had some pretty crazy, interesting arcs this year. Um, And I love that you stuck it out, you stayed with it. And thank you so much to AfterBuzz for always covering it. Veronica, uh, I know you kind of held down the fort yourself this year, and we appreciate it so much. So thank you, everyone. Here's hoping for season three, and I hope you enjoyed the finale of season two of The Outpost. Aw. I want to give a special shout-out to Jake and Anon for taking the time to send me in those videos. I truly appreciate it, and I know that the fans do, too. It was just a little extra touch to add to this two-hour season finale. So, yeah, guys, and I also want to give a shout-out to Adam Rodriguez in the chat. I just want to say thank you so much for this in advance, Adam. He says, thank you, Veronica, for being an amazing host. I can't wait to see you in the next season of The Outpost. You know, as I mentioned, guys, I wouldn't be able to do this if it wasn't for you. I do this because of you, because I know that you want to talk about this show. I want to talk about this show. I want to see the show grow just like you do. So thank you so much. And now I think I'll go into some predictions of what could happen. TV predictions. All right, guys. Honestly, the only thing that I think that in, there's so much that they could probably happen, but really, what's on my mind right now that I think I would want to see as the story continues is I want to learn more about the Kinge. Obviously, I want to know if it's like the Kinge that is the actual being, and it, they, like I said, they just inhabit bodies of people. I definitely want to learn more about that and their magic. I also want to know what the black bloods are going to do what are their strategy are they just going to hold everyone prisoner are they going to try and revert the way the world back to the way it was where black bloods were superior i'm i'm very curious on kind of where they're going to what they're going to do and i'm very curious what how talon is going to treat that situation i feel she's going to be working extra hard to try and bring the peace between the two sides next season um uh and You know, I think our characters are going to do a lot of self-reflection next season, or at least Gwyn and Garrett. They've had hard seasons, and, you know, so has Talon, and I think they're going to do a lot of self-analyzing and really try and grow into how they want to be now since they've had those moments in the season finale. And, yeah, I think that's that's really all I got for right now. Uh, But let me know what you think how the storyline, how the story will continue. I'd love to hear it. But for right now, guys, that's all. We finished. That was the Outpost Season 2. Again, you know, thank you. I 
I sound like a broken record at this point, but seriously, guys, thank you so much for to the fans, to the cast and crew in the outpost, to you know everyone that has joined me on the show for joining me on this journey. You know, I I took on the role of having to do this show myself, and it's because of you that I I was able to do it because you're always talking to me about this show. So I really truly thank you for sticking out with me to the very end. And on that note, I'm Veronica Valencia, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at it's me, Veronica underscore V. If you want to continue following my After Buzz journey, you can also start catching me on the Survivor After Show Wednesdays at 9 p.m. Pacific time. Again, thank you everyone so much for tuning in to the Outpost After Show for season two, and we'll see what happens with the possible season three. Bye, guys. Our founder, Kevin Undergaro, and me, Maria Menunos, would like to thank you for tuning in to AfterBuzz TV. Remember, we're not just the first, we're the biggest in the world, and we're the only destination for all your favorite TV shows. Whatever you crave, we've got it. So go to AfterBuzzTV.com and check out our lineup. Buzz you later. <laughs> the views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.